Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to the session. I'm really glad to see everyone in person. I hope you guys can see my sincere smile behind the mask. My topic today is about uh, autoencoder-based anomaly detection. I worked uh, with predictive maintenance use case for a while, and this is a lot of this is based on practical lessons I learned from the use cases. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Yingxi Zhang. I'm a senior data scientist at Databricks. I've been with the company for about one and a half year, almost one and a half year. I've been with the company for almost one and a half year. If you guys are, were here Monday for the training sessions, we probably have already met. I was teaching the machine learning, uh, managing machine learning and deploying machine learning models classes on Monday. And teaching is a critical portion of my job at Databricks. Besides teaching, I also work closely with clients on uh, machine, their machine learning development and deployment processes. Uh, as I said, I worked with uh, predictive maintenance for wind, uh, for wind turbine project for a while, and a lot of the talk content ba is based on that experience. And uh, as uh, the moderator mentioned, I'm also a proud yogi. That's just my fancy way to say that I only do low intensity workouts. <laughs> All right, what we are going to talk about today is we'll go over a quick overview on anomaly detection and autoencoders, and then we'll focus in on how to scale autoencoders on the lake house, how to do the training distributedly, and also make deployment much easier. A brief introduction on anomaly detection. Anomaly detection is a common use case across industries. You can use anomaly detection for predictive maintenance to detect whether this machine is working in its healthy states or it is having a failure. And it's very common used in the financial industry for fraud detection as well. When it comes to, those are uh, respect, with respect to, uh, to structured data when it comes to images and video processing, anomaly detection models can also be used for uh, image, medical image diagnosis or, or surveillance video monitoring as well. But the common challenges for anomaly detection use cases are, first of all, anomaly labels are subjective and hard, to, hard and expensive to acquire. In those cases, the label has already been prepared and provided for you Anomalies are the rare cases and underrepresented in your data set. This makes the boundary between normal data and abnormal data very subjective and unclear to define. And most of cases, anomaly detection usually have a strong correlation with the time domain. You want to an analyze historical behavior and compare it with the current behavior to see whether uh, there is any ab uh, abnormal signals. And at the same time, you probably want to look back a time window rather than just looking at one single instance. So that correlation with time causes high dimensional features and making analysis relatively complicated. So a non linear, unsupervised model is preferable. The industry has a, prefer has a trend, and autoencoder is a popular tool to use for anomaly detection use cases. Let's take a look at the autoencoder architecture first. Autoencoder has this symmetric hourglass architecture. It has an encoder network and also a decoder network. The encoder translates its, the original high dimensional input data to the bottleneck layer and produces the lower dimension latency vectors. It's a nonlinear dimension reduction if you think it that way. And then the output from the latent space will be input to the decoder, and then decoder will try to mirror the architecture of the encoder and reconstruct the data from the input data. You can use very, you can have very flexible architecture, architecture choices when choosing, when building an autoencoder. You can use dense CNN, LSTM, or build customized layers for your architecture, and the latent space is just a nonlinear transfer re representation of your input data. 
Similar as any uh, dimension reduction algorithm would do, the latent space produces embeddings of your data. Those embeddings thus can be used for downstream tasks like clustering your anomaly uh, types or clustering your healthy data types. So the steps usually we would do, we would perform for um, uh, autoencoder modeling are listed here. We will first build like, of course, you will first understand your data, trying to get data insights, build the right uh, features, cleanse your data, and then build your model architecture. The selection of model architecture is a common discussion, and we will have soon coming slides talking a little bit more about that. Assuming you already have your network being constructed and ready to train, those will be the following steps. We train autoencoder on normal data only, and will compute the reconstructed error distribution of your normal data. Once we have that information, we'll try to choose a proper reconstructed error threshold, and anything about that thre threshold coming from the new data will be considered a norm an abnormal data. There are limitations of the classic autoencoder as well. The main, uh, the main limitation is that uh, autoencoder is a deterministic model, and the mapping between latent space to the data space is deterministic, making the interpolation and extrapolation from latent space back to the input space or back to the original dimension challenging. So this is to say autoencoder is not a generic generative model, if you want to generate new data from the latent space, this is not the right choice. Depends on your use cases, there are some variations you can use uh, to make it more generative or to have even more control of how to generate the data. So a few like options I have listed as extensions here is variational autoencoder and conditional variational encoder. Feel free to check out more information on those in, on those, and uh, we'll try to like uh, talk about uh, t focusing on the implementation of autoencoders. So we have covered some basic concepts, but when it comes to implementation, what are the common pitfalls, right? The two most common questions I have experienced when working with autoencoder models is, first of all, what type of network should I use? Should I use a dense network, or should I use CNN or LSTM? And the second is, how do I choose the reconstructed error threshold? So let's try to tackle them one by one. For the first question, what type of network should I use? Uh, my opinionated answer to that is, Data insights is key. Let's be data centric, trying to pay much, as much attention as your data, spend as much effort in your data analysis before you start to build out models. Some straightforward uh, approach in machine learning or deep learning models still, still applies. For example, when you have image computer vision use cases, it's very straightforward to choose a CNN network. But at the same time, what if you want to concatenate multiple images together? Do you want to select a subset of one image and concatenate them? Or do you want to analyze the correlation of time series between those multiple frames? Then in those cases, you need to choose between like concatenated frames or CNN LSTMs. Similar in time series use cases, we can build dense layers as your architecture design. When you have like good feature engineering, you can select it, the right window size, being able to extract the most critical information from your uh, aggregated statistics or rolling statistics. Um, on the other hand, uh, LSTM could be a possible solution for time series applications as well. You just need to think about the trade-off between the training time, computing resources, and model accuracy and model generability. To elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, I have this example uh, using wind speed uh, as a, a, a shared feature for two different use cases. We have the same raw wind speed data for two separate use cases. When we're trying to uh, detect abnormal user behavior of a bike sharing app, 
probably an aggregation of that uh, maximum or medium wind within an hourly window or even a daily window is appropriate uh, context contextual information for your model. But on the other hand, if you are trying to do a predict maintenance case, trying to see whether your machine or devices has been behaving normal uh, with respect to uh, the wind gust, which happens within like a minutes level, then your you need to choose like a window size, which can be uh, which need to be as fine as uh, one minute to run the analysis. So think about how you can use your data and extract the feature that best fits to your use case. That's way more important than choose the proper architecture or network. All right, when we come to the second question, how to select the reconstructed error threshold, um, there are a few uh, things we can, a few tricks we can apply here. Uh, first is like make sure we use both normal and abnormal data in the evaluation process. So when, when we train our autoencoder, we train it on the normal data only, but let's not throw away the abnormal data and fully use it in our evaluation process. So this way, it will give you a clearer decision boundary between the normal and abnormal behavior. And at the same time, instead of using like raw reconstructed error as your threshold, think about using uh, aggregated results. It could be a mean value within a time window you selected. So for example, you probably consider your uh, devices is failing when uh, the threshold, the reconstructed error threshold mean value within an hour has reached one certain threshold. Or in some cases, it could be accumulated rolling statistics, right? It could be a gradual change to your devices and you accumulate the reconstructed error throughout the historical to current time. When the accumulated error reaches a certain level, then you consider this is like a, a time that trigger that failure detection. And the third trick here is to use multiple metrics. So uh, when we build models and train models, we rely on per sample instance. But when we do evaluation, it ha we can do both duration level metrics and instance level metrics. Duration level metrics example include mean average, uh, mean absolute percentage error on the normal period. So you have a long period, say one year of period where your machine has behaved like normal, but then your sample period could be at 10 minutes level. So within this whole one year of data, you have a lot of samples to um, test your model on those normal data to see within this normal duration, how many times that reconstructed error has uh, that reconstructed error matrix you choose has been above the threshold, giving you a false positive alarm. Or on the other hand, you can also compute the duration matrix at abnormal period. Same thing, you, taking that period as, consider, as your metric base. And on the, on the same time, you can also do like instance metrics. So in the past year, your device has failed three times and applying this model to your historical testing data, how many times it can detect the failures can be another metric to use to, eval to truly evaluate the overall performance of the model and select the correct threshold. All right, to summarize a little bit, Using both normal and abnormal data in the reconstructed error threshold choice will help clarify the decision boundary between healthy and unhealthy data. And a few, uh, when selecting metrics, we can use both duration metrics and instance metric and build that in your uh, reconstructed error threshold selection choices. All right, uh, now let's talk about how to scale anomaly detection training. Say you have a group of devices. Is there a way to run or train one model per group instance in parallel? And once we have 
that multiple models per group instance. How do we make our deployment easier? Do we deploy one model? Uh, do we deploy the mod multiple models so in the end there will be multiple models running in the back end and the user need to properly choose which model to use when applying to the new data or how do we make this easier? So again, the naive approach is we can use a for loop every time we just iterate through your data in the training process and find the segment of data for each group instance. And then we got to manage the experiment, tra the training experiment per instance manually and find the model per instance through an iterative approach. The smarter way to do here is to use Pandas function API. We will write user-defined uh, Python functions for the training process, prediction process, and evaluation process. And we will use a group by apply in Pandas, which is a mapped group by Pandas UD UDF to the entire data frame and being able to execute the user-defined Pandas UDFs in parallel. So this is a quick code snip, and we'll get to like code demo soon. Basically, you will have your training function here, and this training function is taking a Spark data frame as input, um, and what it returns is a group byte uh, re result. So your data frame uh, will be trained. Uh, your data frame will have the data coming from all the group instance. But what we are doing here, we're going to group by group this data frame by the key, which is device ID in this case, and then apply this uh, custom uh, this user defined Python UDF. And what this Python UDF does in the end is it will basically uh, take the data per instance and then build this anomaly. Uh, to build this autoencoder model, train each autoencoder model per instance, and save the model information from the training process to a return data frame. So if um, you are not familiar with Pandas UDF, basically Pandas UDF need to take two key inputs. First one is the actual Python function, and then the second one is the return schema. That's why here, when we actually uh, return the training result, we need to provide this uh, customer-defined UDF and also the return schema. You can see that the return is basically our concatenated information about the trained model per instance, and we can take a deeper look when we get to the demo session. So now you have your model being fully trained. How do we uh, deploy those models? So the process for anomaly detection is usually you have some time series of sensor measurement and you have historical anomaly records. We need to merge the information together and run some data pre-processing uh, and get visualization training post-processing done. And with all that, model being uh, processed and ready, we need to apply it to uh, the inference pipeline. So the model has, uh, the model might have like both online and offline features. So online features are features you can uh, pre-compute it. So whether to apply those offline features uh, prior to your model training or within the model training have like pros, pros and cons for uh, both. So if you have feature processing prior to model training, you basically compute that features once and reuse it. A common way is to write it to a feature store and then later ask the model to retrieve it from feature store. It's, uh, it's slower to iterate, uh, but you can utilize the full data and uh, you can utilize the full, full data and compute just only once. On the contrary, if you compute the features within the model, it makes the model iteration easier uh, by also increase like model latency depends on transformation overheads and data visibility. So for this demo, we're just assuming all the visualization is done ahead of the model and there are uh, no 
uh, features we're going to compute on the fly. But in the case you have features that you need to compute on the fly, a quick example would be something you only uh, acquire at the inference time, right? For example, uh, the current uh, information about a device can be an online feature. Then those online feature has to be encapsulated within the model object. And what we're going to show is that we want to, once we have this model ready, we want to incorporate it together with the entire data pipeline. If you have your data pipeline to ingest new coming uh, da sensor data, how do we uh, add the final step of machine learning prediction and being able to save the prediction result back to the uh, data lake? Here is a quick summary of uh, what, we, what we are going to demo. We will build a custom, custom ML flow model that will package the feature engineering and the post-processing uh, steps in the model. And then for batch inference, we'll use uh, Pandas UDF again to distribute the inference uh, per instance. And then in the streaming cases, it is a unified API with batch and we will like integrate with a streaming uh, DLT pipeline. There are also cases where you would want to have uh, real-time inference and want to build a REST endpoint of the models. So we'll also show how to build a custom uh, MLflow model where it serves as an ensemble of multiple models and being able to uh, generate a REST endpoint out of that. All right, here comes the demo part. So the demo notebooks has been published in this repo, and you can see this is actually forked from uh, IoT demo. So a huge shout out to my coworker, Guang Jie. We built this together for a customer demo, and he basically built a really nice uh, DLT pipeline simulating data streaming from IoT devices and go through the medallion process, uh, uh, generate the bronze, gold, bronze, silver, and the golden tables, and then we're going to use those cleansed golden table for machine learning use cases. If you're interested, definitely check out uh, the data prep DLT folder of this repository. And for today's demo, we're going to focus on the anomaly detection portion of it. So we'll like first build and train the autoencoder models and then deploy the autoencoder model. So in this notebook, after we have done like proper settings and merge the input data to have both the features and the labels. So you can see we're using some simulated features uh, for a wind turbine case. And then there's uh, two labels uh, for training purposes. So here is how we're going to do the distributed training. So the steps to train a single encoder are like build the network, train the model with normal data, and then use a validation data set. So for each step in the training process, include for, uh, for the training, evaluation, and prediction, we'll, uh, we'll use a pandas EDF for each of the step and distribute the processing uh, for each group instance. And we also want to like start tracking uh, the model experiments. So we create a MLflow experiment uh, and we'll use MLflow autolog to log the training process um, per, um, in, per group instance. So this is the main training function. We have a few uh, modules. First, uh, build an autoencoder architecture. Here I'm just using a simple uh, dense uh, architecture, it has like two layers. So the encoder has two layers. Then our uh, decoder have two layers. The last layer is to reconstruct the input uh, from the autoencoder. Once we have the model being compiled, we get to this training UDF. So this training UDF is assuming uh, to work 
per instance level. So what we will need to provide, we'll, we'll need to like retrieve some metadata information uh, from the data frame. So we'll need to get um, the device ID, so which device we are, uh, which device this data set is, and uh, we're going to like train the model for this device. So getting the features and prepare uh, to train the data, prepare to train the model. For each training process, we're going to utilize uh, nested MLflow runs. So all the model training will be scoped in a parent run and each individual device will have a child run uh, being, will have a child run representing that device. So when we train each device, we'll just log the device information and then train the model and return the device uh, model information. So when we return, here I'm only returning device ID, parent run ID, parent MLflow run ID, and the child MLflow run ID. Later we'll retrieve the model artifact from the MLflow runs. So here is the return schema and then we can apply the parent run to the overall uh, entire data frame and group by device ID and apply this training function. So you can see here uh, once we provide uh, our features and we can like get our training results. So training results will be the number of rows you have for this training result will just be uh, the number of instances you have um, for your group column. And you can see here we listed the MLflow run ID per, uh, per model. Now we have the information, uh, the model information we need to use it to generate the predictions and uh, apply the prediction to evaluation data set and also compute the reconstructed error. So we need to have a distributed predict function as well. Same story, we'll build this predict UDF that's going to be work on the data frame per instance and then do a group by to generate the prediction results. So apply this prediction function to evaluation data and then we can uh, have the evaluation function to choose the reconstructed error threshold. So basically in the prediction function, you can see we have um, the logic of how to compute the reconstructed errors. Here I'm using a log error per, uh, per input feature and also taking the total average of all the features as the final reconstructed error. Once you have the reconstructed error logic, you can uh, choose your threshold logic. Here I'm using a simple F beta score as the threshold for choosing the proper uh, threshold. Same thing, this evaluation is going to be uh, applied per instance and we use like pandas UDF to do the distributed computation. So in the end, uh, the evaluation result will return device ID, uh, your model run ID, but uh, together with your chosen reconstructed threshold and your uh, final evaluation metrics based on this chosen threshold. All right, so when we have like batch inference, uh, it's quite straightforward to use the predict to use the predict function we just defined uh, earlier in this notebook in uh, inference pipeline. And this way uh, we will be able to generate prediction, we'll be able to generate final predictions um, based on the entire batch data. So this batch data have information from all the turbines and then it will uh, find the proper model based on the device ID column and then select the right model based on the MLflow run ID and uh, apply the model prediction from there and create the final anomaly detection label. And in the streaming case, we can take a look at the DLT pipeline. So the last step here is to generate 
uh, power prediction. And we can see from the DLT pipeline notebook that we apply the same predict method using the group by UDF to attach to the streaming pipeline and generate the predictions for the stream batches as well. So this is uh, the prediction step added to the entire streaming pipeline for uh, streaming inferences. And in the case of real-time deployment, what we are doing here is we're going to build a customized MLflow Python function, Python model that will encapsulate, that will ensemble all the models together and create a REST endpoint out of that. So let's get to the uh, model preparation. So we will first need to build some model artifact. Uh, we build, we create a map which will map the device ID to the model artifact and use the model, model artifact as context for the MLflow uh, Python. So you can see uh, the artifact represents uh, your model per device and the model, loca model artifact location. And we also uh, need to prepare the dependencies for um, the dependencies for the ensemble customized model. Here, uh, there's only a slightly uh, a slight change with respect to how the model is original logged is this protobuf, uh, is this protobuf version has to be uh, earlier than 4.0 to avoid like the serving a serving issue and then we start to build this customized MLflow model um, so this is going to be an inherited instance from MLflow Python Python model um, you can implement your online featureization step within the model as well. And then the load context is basically loading the model artifacts we have prepared ahead of time. And then in the prediction function, we can predict per device and then use a apply, a pandas apply function to generate the final prediction result based on uh, each device ID. So same, similar logic here. Uh, within the predict per device, we need to understand, retrieve the device ID information, and then um, use the artifact we provided to select the correct model, and then generate predictions from there. All right, so once we build this customized uh, model class, we need to create an instance out of, instance out of that class and uh, log this customized model. So we were going to use like MLflow Python to log this model, um, provide like all the information like input examples, signatures, uh, conda environment. In the end, you can see uh, what has been logged here uh, is in the model registry. And if I get to the model registry page, uh, we can build like a serving endpoint uh, from this model. I have already like enabled the serving where we can see um, it's the endpoint is ready, and we can uh, send a sample request um, to get a response out of it. And you can see here, it does uh, take the device ID information as input. So if you uh, have a mini batch of data coming from all the devices, it will be able to generate the predictions for each device. All right, so that's all about uh, everything about the demo. And to summarize, the benefits of using autoencoders for anomaly detection is that it is suitable for highly imbalanced data. Um, you have flexible choices of network architectures. It also generates nonlinear embeddings, which can be used for downstream tasks. And the way to scale autoencoder uh, solutions for training, we can train one model per group instance in parallel with Pandas UDF. And for deployment, uh, we can build MLflow Python models to ensemble all the models into one and deploy that single model as REST endpoint. And it can also be used in batch and streaming uh, pipelines as well. All right, any questions? I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> Sure.
Shri. But happy to take questions out, uh, out of the podium. Yeah, we'll spend a few minutes in questions. Hey, uh, so you said when, you, when you're training a model per group, right? Uh, can you please clarify like how you're going to like feed in the abnormal and normal data at every group? You're going to do that? Or so the training? Can you please clarify that? Like how, how is that going to work, right? Right, so the training is basically, um, the model fitting is basically on normal data only. So yeah. at each step, yeah. the process is distributed. So the chain UDF will do the model.fit, and that's going to be distributed for the entire group. At the same time, once you have the chain, uh, the, the model being trained, we're going to use predict and evaluate with the combination of normal and abnormal data to select the threshold. So the evaluate and predict uh, function will also be distributed using the Pandas UDF. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Uh, hi, a quick one. So when you uh, apply in Pandas and you choose group by field, so uh -huh. it was device ID, what if you have uh, imbalanced data? So for some device you have like, I don't know, gigabytes of data, terabytes, and for some you have like, I don't know, 10 nodes. And like, how, do you, how is it possible to balance that? Right, that's a great point. I think it will have some impact on the performance of your parallel training. Um, in that case, maybe try to pre-process what, this is like thinking out of my mind right now. So you probably you can do some pre-processing, trying to balance that data and uh, train based on those even relatively evenly distributed instances. And for those skewered data sets with a smaller with smaller samples, maybe group them into another group and maybe separate the process. This is what I can think of out of, on top of my mind right now. But I don't know, maybe Connor, you, do you have any comments here? 